those talks that wanders a bit and it's a bit thin because I've got a lot to cover. Um, I'm going to try and convince you about the fact that you need to learn new ways of thinking um, and put that in a Java context. So, 25 years ago, I can't believe I said this, 25 years ago I joined IBM. I joined for three years, that was my plan, but I stayed. Um, I came from a background, a developer background, we wore suits and ties and I took those off and I never put them on. And I got hired by IBM because I had some really serious AS Rondo skills because I worked for a company that engineered these things. So I knew a lot about the AS Rondo. And they were looking for those skills. And you may remember, those of you old enough, um, that that's how we used to find people, was stacks of skills. You know, you're a, you're a x86 guy, you're a Linux guy, you're a Solaris guy. Um, and that was how life was. And then a few years after that, not that many year, that years later, I'm sitting in San Francisco in Cupertino, and I'm working with a bunch of Sun guys, and we're talking about garbage collection. Um, it was an interesting conversation because I was working on with the AS100 team. How many knows? How many people here AS100 heard of them anyway? Yes, thank you. Old stuff. Um, when Java came out, why do we get involved in Java? Uh, because it had some characteristics about, there was things about Java that we, for IBM, really liked. Um, and at the time, we looked at it as very much a glue thing. And what it was really good at doing was giving that platform across all other platforms. However, and the reason I was in this office talking to these guys was our view of a platform and their and Son's view of a platform was so far apart. Um, and we used to say IBM does desktop up and Sun does desktop down. So I'm sitting there in an office talking to a Sun guy going, we talk about garbage collection and we talk about how we're going to configure it. And he's going, yeah, 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 that's not, that will work because we've got the maximum, we're doing 500 meg heaps. Remember, this is way years ago. 500 meg heaps. Mm -hmm. And again, that's really cool. I've got a 130 gig heap, mm -hmm. right? Your configuration doesn't work for my machine, right? But we were on one platform. It was all Java. It was fantastic. And for the last 20 years, almost 20 years, Java has been that fantastic beast. You know, if it's an operating system from Palm, who remembers Palms? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Just say you're old, um, <laughs> right? It's all that domain frames from memory in kilobytes. Yes, literally, you can run Java in kilobytes, not megabytes, through to terabytes and more beyond. There are machines. I mean, I've, we've built them. Terabyte VMs, not a big deal, right? Hundred terabyte machines, not a big deal. Well, a big deal, but possible, uh, but actually not particularly relevant anymore. And devices. Do you remember? I don't remember, they always said Java started because they were trying to put Java on a toaster. They were an internet-enabled toaster. Right? <laughs> right. And that's what, that's what some were looking at, small devices. And we turned up and said, that's really cool. What about bigger devices? Right. And so that's where the partnership began. And displays from midlets. I don't know if you remember midlets, tiny, tiny things for mobile phones, all the way up to, through UIs, up to real headless, where you've got servers. You don't need UI. Right? And architectures from ARM chips to 390 chips. The whole works. And for a long, long time, that has been our world. And it's been a great world. All we've ever done is talk Java. We've never had to worry about anything else. But unfortunately, that started to falter. Right? So there's some small reasons for it. Um, for instance, on the small end, the small devices, well... When we tried to create JVMs on small devices, we didn't make the best design decisions. And so that bit, um, Java a bit. There's a lot of people don't use Java anymore because it's old. You know, it's been around 20 years. It's your father's thing, so you don't want to use it. Right? But actually, we claim most of the reason that Java is 
losing the edges and is being seen as less relevant is because we haven't evolved it fast enough. You look at how long it's taken to get stuff out. So <coughs> we're looking at Jigsaw. Jigsaw's coming out in Java 9. It's 10 years since we started having conversations. Right. I remember those co early conversations with Mark Reinhold and others, and there was all these conversations about what it was going to do, and we had conversations about whether it was going to be something new or OSGI and all these things, and it just went on and on and on. It's a big job for sure, but it still took 10 years. <coughs> uh, the Lambda JSR, again, took five. Right? It's just not fast enough. Right? And then we've got cloud and containers. So cloud says fast startup, uh, small memory footprint because you charge for memory. Uh, we want to have it in containers. We want um, high resiliency. We want a whole bunch of things that Java was never even thought about doing. Right? And they, they're here. They're now. We already know that. right? So the question is, is Java going the way of the dodo? Right? Are we on the slippery slope? And have I hoodwinked you into coming to hear about the end of Java rather than the future of Java? Right? And is Jay Gosling's vision of Java on the toaster toast? Okay. Well, let's look at where we need to put Java. So we need to put it in the cloud. Uh, we need to do data analytics because that's another big thing that's appearing. I quite like the logo, but I'm not sure if it means data analytics. And then machine learning, right? That's where we're going to put Java, because we're struggling in all those spaces. So what are we going to do? So whatever we do, we've got to have a language that is more, that's going to be higher up when people choose things. It doesn't mean to say that we need Java that does the best for everything. But if you look at any of the current competitors, right, and they've all got different reasons for why they're, competition, they're competitors, um, <coughs> We've got to do better than those in all these spaces to, con to continue. So let's let's measure ourselves against these these spaces, right? Let's have some races. So this is audience participation, okay? I'm going to show you a few benchmarks, um, and we'll talk about how whether they're any good or not later. But let's start with the first one. Um, Anybody benchmark? This is a benchmark about you've got one CPU, so. You know, restricted, and there's an algorithm that's going to be implemented in a set of program languages. It's a small algorithm, which is the point of the micro benchmark, and it's going to let you. It's going to calculate so many thousand new positions of the Jovian planets, right? It's a straightforward algorithm. There's lots and lots of number calculating, right? And it's basically who gets there first. Right. <clears throat> so let me line them up. <coughs> Excuse me. Ruby, Python 3, Go, Node, Swift, Java. Okay, who thinks who thinks Java's the best node number cruncher in the world? Who thinks Java's gonna win? Oh, okay. Uh, Swift? Who knows sorry, people do you know about Swift? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, Swift. Is Swift gonna win? Node? Is that node? Uh, I, vote, I think my vote's for Swift or Go. Swift or Go, excellent. Um, go Python, 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 yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's not get that. Hold up, Ruby, Ruby, okay, you guys are just loosen up, go get a beer, right? Okay, so I'm going to start. This is real time, thereabouts, five seconds, ten seconds. We didn't do any pets. No, good. 15 seconds. They're still going. Uh, 20 seconds. Ah, that's the stop. Ah, who won? Ooh, okay. And they're sticky going. Okay. Right, so do you think these two have stopped? No, probably not. No, no. Okay, so here's the numbers. Go did it in 21 seconds. Swift in 21 seconds, Java in 22, there's not much in it. Node was a bit less behind. Ruby and Python. <laughs> They're the guys at the back of the marathon. 
But right. it, it all depends how you use it, because I was in a presentation of Instagram, and they are using Python as well in Instagram. Yep. They explain how you scale the Python, so yep. I, I yep. believe in Yeah, yeah. Bear with me. That's one benchmark. <clears throat> Okay, I, I get your point. Let me show you another one. Oh, some more data just to go. So um, these are graphs about so these in different languages. These are the different languages. So you can see CPU. Um, I took out Ruby and Python because all the time they were running, they were running high CPU. So you know, on this scale, they'd be on the top of the off the ceiling. But you can see that basically they run about the others run about the same amount of CPU. Java and Node use lots of memory, Swift not so much, and Go a little. Cool. Characteristics. Right. How about another one? So that was a single CPU thing, um, which isn't particularly useful now because we've all got quad cores and things like that. So let's run it. Let's run this. So this is um, Mandelbrot pictures. This is you create a big array, and you do calculations on each element. It's a big array. Uh, 1600 by 1600 <coughs> and then you write it as a bitmap okay uh, and so you've got four processors running now so different story so let me line them up okay so come on who thinks Java is going to come well not from the back but who thinks Java is going to win this one is this single thread still? no this is four cores four threaded well multi-threaded there's a guy at the back there who's getting it wrong. Okay, uh, <laughs> Swift. Swift. Swift's pretty good. Node. No, 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 no dear. Okay. <coughs> Go. Okay. Look, I'll just run it. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Oh, well, Swift's over already. Woo. Go next. Java's finished. Uh, one of these is going to finish next, obviously. And it's going to be, oh, it's Node, right? OK. OK, and so guess what? They didn't finish either. Wow, OK. Swift did that one in three seconds. Go did it in five and a half. Java, six. Node, 20 seconds. And these two things, way, way out, right? And if you look at the CPU for this, CPU time, uh, again, they are taking the Python and Ruby ones out because they just would skew the, you just wouldn't be able to see this, right? But you can see there's not much in it. Memory-wise, not much, but Node used a load of memory. So Node wasn't too good on the compute, but it, and it used a load of memory. Now, this is a four CPU thing, so I can show you another picture, which shows you how much of the CPUs are being used. And again, Java Swift node, you can see that pretty much other than node, they're all fully utilized, which is cool. This is what you want to see. Okay. Okay, so I've got one or two more. Keep bear with me. How about garbage collection? How do you measure garbage collection? Well, one of the things you can do is construct construct a benchmark which drives the generation of um, garbage. So this is a binary tree. You know, it's like you build a binary tree, and then what you're going to do is add and subtract so many elements randomly. I think it's, I'm not sure it's random, but in the same way on all of these languages, okay? So the idea is this will stress your system, and you'll see how good you're at GC. Okay, same thing again. Okay, who thinks Java's going to win this one? Because Java's got the best GC ever. Oh, God. You guys, yeah? <laughs> You know, what money are you get at the horse on? None at all. Okay. Um, <laughs> who thinks Swift is going to be good? Yeah, look, look, good, good. Uh, node? Ah, Go? Yeah, okay. Python? Ingo, isn't it manual? I mean, isn't it something like C++? Yeah. I mean, in that case, those are good. Yeah, for a long time, they just weren't sweet. Yeah. I mean, it's parallel now, but it's just... Yeah. You may read those words, sir. <laughs> right? Python and root. Well, we know what happens to them. Okay, so let me run this one. Okay. And who stops first? Oh, Swift. So go in a minute. 
Go in a minute. Go. 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 Job is finished. <laughs> okay. And 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 wow. Wow. Did they finish? <laughs> well, the good news is we're not in minutes anymore, but they're off the end thing. So it's Swift, five seconds, Java, eight and a half, Go, 35 seconds, Node, Ruby, okay, about the same Python. So these are, these are small benchmarks, right? They're not big things, and they are to be taken with a big pinch of salt, but they're there to give you an understanding of how some of these programming languages might behave, right? If you look at the CPU, um, I can now get Python and Ruby on the CPU because I didn't use so much. Python's a bit expensive. Memory-wise, Java takes a lot. Swift, hardly anything for this one. Node a lot, right? So, no, Java and Node tend to take more memory than the others, right? And in terms of CPU, these four processors, Java's not too bad. Um, Goes pretty good, but again, even though it's well balanced, it seemed to still take a very long time. Uh, Swift, I'm quite sure what's happening there. Node, you know, Node is mostly single threaded, and Node really whacked through this one. Right. Right. So, can you call things out from that? Well, you can. So, I'm going to do one more, right? Because I'm trying to cut through these languages. This is a regular expression parsing benchmark. So there's a bunch of data that looks like genes, and there's some rules, and it's implemented the same way in every programming language, right? and then it's run. Now, I didn't put it on the others, but this was this benchmark result. They all came from the same thing, um, basically latest and greatest. Okay, So this is regular expression parsing on a four-way machine. OK, come on then. Let's see if you can get it right. Do you think Java's going to win? Yeah, maybe. Swift? Yeah, Swift, yeah. Yeah, Swift, Swift, Swift. Uh, Node? Mm, yeah, maybe not. Uh, Go? Go might come back. Okay. Uh, yeah. Python, maybe? Python. <laughs> it's better than you thought. Okay, so let me run this one. Here we go. Right. Five seconds. Node's finished. <laughs> what? <laughs> Job is finished. Excellent. So, which of these two is going to get there first? Swift or Go? Python's just finished. What? <laughs> right. And, and, yeah, well, there we go. It's a long race. So, Ruby's actually finished, right? Right. So, again, the scores. No, this time, you should have bet your money on that one. Four seconds. <laughs> Java, not bad. Python, amazingly, comes in from being minutes and minutes and minutes. Ruby, similar. Go, compared to other things, way out. And Swift, don't know what happened there. Right? And you look at these things. You look at CPU, not much CPU being used. Java's got lots of memory. Node's got lots of memory. Swift is pretty low. And the others are not so much. And then if you look at the CPU... Java was the only one that managed to get the maximum amount of throughput out of all this, right? That worked really hard to get there. Some of the other languages, so Node you're not going to expect, because Node is basically single-threaded anyway. That's its design point. Uh, Swift didn't do too well, and these others, well, they're okay, but Java was quite good, right? It's not the best, right? So, the, all of these benchmarks come from this place. Um, and one of the important things is that you can't really use any of these to compare the programming languages. Right? Now, I've done it for a bit of fun, but also because, to a degree, there is some reality in there. Okay? Because you can see already what some of these programming languages are going to do. Right? Um, now, we're pretty hard on Node in, the, in this set because it's not very good at um, computing um, and it's not very good at multi-threading. But it was never designed to. Right. So if I look at something different, so this is um, a screenshot from 
Um, we have these open source tools for doing app metrics. So you can do, so it's basically the same tool as Node and Swift and Java. You can install it, blah, blah, blah. You get some screenshots out of it. This is, the benchmark in here is basically a driver program that's making requests to three different application servers, one in Node, one in Swift, one in Java. What they're doing is the least they can do to respond. So there's nothing half fancy, it's make a call, get a response, right? Swift, sorry, Swift is coming in about eight seconds, eight milliseconds, or well, six milliseconds in there. Look where Node is, Node's down here, consistently, right, naught and two milliseconds. Java, that's 80 milliseconds, that's 20 milliseconds, right? That's where Node is, right? Node's strength is in that space. Right, and that's why people use it. Right. So these part benchmarks are meant to be fun, and I, you can go to that website, and you can go see, and you can go see all the different times that people have tried to improve the scores, right? And there's a guy at the back said about Python stuff. I'm sure that if somebody knew what they're doing and had a go at the benchmark, they might better get to go faster. But it's not about professional people who can tweak it. It's about the general populace. It's like, what can we get out of these things, right? So we're beginning, we have trends, right? You can see things out of this. So what do you see? Right. So we know about Node. Node wins the cloud IO space. Right? If you're looking now at architectures, you see Node at the front. Node is doing the IO, Node is the, Node is the server. Right? The back end is going to be Java. The front end is going to be Node with some bits in the middle. Right? But it's not something you do for compute intent, so you pick a different programming language, which is generally Java. Right. And then you've got Swift. So Swift is really good for memory constrained devices, as you'd imagine, because it's designed to go on these things. But it's actually pretty good in the cloud, where having less memory is cost effective. If you have a smaller footprint, it saves you money. So it, it's, it's eating Java's lunch in that space. Right, but it doesn't go to all the platforms, so I don't know, and it doesn't scale as well as Java yet. Right, so we've got Node having a go, we have Swift having a go. Right, um, Go was on there a lot, but actually, Go is more of a C programming language than perhaps something for you're going to use to contend with app servers, etc. More likely, we'll put Go in the JVM than we would. Um, um, see it being turned into a big competitor, right? And then we've got the others like Ruby. Um, Ruby's more like <coughs> Node because it's interpreted. I mean, it's it's a scripting language, and Ru Ruby is, which is really sad because I like Ruby. Um, apart, the only time I write Ruby now is when I'm playing with great vagrant files, right? but I do like it. Right? And then Python. Python is a strange beast because it's being used in data analytics and machine learning. It is the primary programming language for you to learn if you're going to go and do data analytics, machine learning, neural networks. Mostly, you're going to go learn Python. And the reason that you're going to learn Python is because from a Java of a community point of view, we sort of let that happen because we didn't evolve fast enough. Right? I mean, partly it's because it was the old as well. It's not Java, so therefore it must be good. But a lot of this was so much down to us going, we know what we could do, but we didn't do it fast enough. Right? So that's why you'll see that IBM, as a playlist community, but also from a commercial interest, is investing in these three programming languages because that's where they fit. Right? We know how they overlap. Right? We know that there are different communities. There's a Java community. I'm going to talk about a Swift community or a Node community. If I do that, I reach pretty much everybody I care about. Um, and these are the things that are running on cloud. These are things that are on desktops. These are things running on um, small devices. That's where the money is. Okay, So that's why we're doing these things. But what about, uh, what about data analytics and machine learning? What are we going to do to get Java in there? Because I said that's a challenge. We need to get Java to be better, right? Well, so let's talk about 
let's talk about Java and Java Swift, Java Script and sorry Node and Swift as things as VMs as runtimes. So the first ironic thing is, well, what are they written in? They're all written in C. So the behaviour that you've seen in those benchmarks comes out of the design more than it comes out of anything else. It's not like we wrote one in C and one in basic, right? They were all the same, okay? And they have different design characteristics. So the first one, let's do the first one. So this is a runtime language. So it has a VM, that's a runtime. That's Java code, Java, your Java code is compiled to bytecode, <laughs> excuse me. JavaScript executes script. The JavaScript goes from JavaScript to machine code. And Swift is a compiler. That's it. It takes Swift and it turns it into machine code and some work with a, a, a low-level VM, LLVM in this case. Right. Java is type safe. Right. That's massive. That's a really big win for us. So type safe means when you know what it is, what something is, it's always that thing. Right? So an int is an int is an int. And that means JITs can do fabulous things because we can look at where that's an int all the way through. So if I know that it's an int, an int, an int I can compile, I can optimize massively. I can get away with your, throw away your methods. I can throw away nested methods. I can throw away complex instruction, um, complex um, combinations of methods because I can work out what it's trying to do because it's type safe. Right? With JavaScript, I can't do that. With JavaScript, I don't know that an int's an int. Right? It's a thing until the very last minute. Right? So if you think about um, what that means is the, op the opportunity for optimization disappears. It's very small, right? Um, Swift, well, Swift's got type A, so that's fine, right? So in this context, it's the difference between these two. Type safe is one of the biggest things that we have in the Java space. Right? So, bytecode, which we can take to JITs. Bytecode. Bytecode, we can create new bytecodes. We can inst add into Java new things. Right? We can easily install it. We can take your Java code and compile it to new bytecodes. We can create bytecodes. Um, we can modify bytecodes. There's a good um, line between the two. With JavaScript, it isn't. It just goes straight to it goes straight to machine code. And that means anytime you want to make a change to the JavaScript language, everybody's implemented that implemented. It has to go through angst to get the new features into the next implementation. This thing, you basically, you could separate the language evolution from the VM evolution, right? And the other thing that we can do because of this is that we can optimize again and again and again and again. So those micro benchmarks are great, but they don't show Java off in its best light because the thing that Java is very good at is spotting the fact that your workload has changed and going, I can re-engineer, I can re-optimize, right? That is a big plus. Right. And then garbage collection. We have GC. We have some of the best garbage collection technology, probably the best garbage te technology in RVMs, bar none. We have, the industry has spent enormous amounts of money on that. Right. Now, running garbage collection um, in separate threads means you've got to put more memory. We all spend time trying to tune our VM so it doesn't run out of memory. <laughs> And that's because you're trying to get the balance right between how fast GC can capture and keep up with things. So we end up giving more memory for higher throughput because high GC, because GC, our GC, as I said, is the best and is designed for massive throughput. JavaScript has garbage collection, seems to be all right, um, but it's a single threaded thing, so it never seems to get hit that much. Swift uses reference counters. So what that means is, is that every time you use something, you pass it on, a number in the object gets set, and every time you release it, the number goes down. When it gets down to zero, you drive some GC, or you drive some um, 
the allocation. That means uh, two things. One is that you have no idea when garbage collection is going to take place. It takes place on some thread at some point when Solvejits is released, and that might trigger all sorts of long um, memory releases. And the other thing is you can have um, circular references. So you can build up chains that all point to each other, big circle, but they aren't, aren't actually pointed to by anything live, but there's never way, any way they're ever going to get um, removed. So garbage collection, type safety, and our JIT gives, JV, gives the Java VM the strength that the other programming languages don't have. That's why we're still going, right? because of those characteristics. Right. Uh, and threading, yeah, well, we have a really good threading model because it was designed from the beginning. We've put a lot, a lot of effort into making sure that the cost of synchronization is as small as possible, and we work out because we can whether or not we even need to do so. Right. Uh, whereas JavaScript is single-threaded, which is great, means you don't have to do any locking at all. It's all, it's all handlers, it's all callbacks. But it means if you do want to scale, you have to start another process. Right? And you can do that trivially with a JavaScript, but it's heavyweight. Right? And, well, Swift has concurrent work pools, which is basically the same. Right? And Java is everywhere. So is pretty much JavaScript. <coughs> Whereas um, Swift is actually on, mostly on Apple platforms. So, you know, Windows and stuff like that. And Linux. So all this stuff are the characteristics that say we're going to continue to invest in Java and take it where it needs to go. Because at the end of the day, this is so valuable. This is why it's still going, right? No other runtime, however much you can point to any one of them and go, you're faster, or you've got better memory management, or you've got this, or you've got that. The answer is we're not interested, because this is the set that everybody wants to, to move forward. Right. So what are we going to do with Java? We have a cunning plan. Right? So some things have been happening. Um, it's not just about technology. It's about community. It's about the relationships between IBM and Oracle and, and any other body, you know, uh, anybody else is participating, Red Hat, we're a community and we work together. One of the things you would have seen recently is the announcements about a new cadence of Java releases. Right? So we're now going away from having plodding along every so many years for the next release to every six months, dunk, 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 dunk. <coughs> this is in direct response. And Mark Reinhardt was talking about it at the Java One keynote about the fact that we need to go faster. And if we don't go faster, we're going to lose, right? And so we're trying to do that. We're trying to find ways to build faster to release plans. And also, we're working more in the open. So IBM's, <coughs> IBM released uh, Eclipse OpenJ9, or open sourced it. We did Open Liberty, which is our application server. Oracle of moving Java EE to Eclipse. Um, Eclipse MicroProfile is coming around. If we are going to make Java the best and continue to be the best, it's too big to do on our own. We need everyone's input. We need you guys' input, right? And so we need to have this stuff open sourced because the only way that we can experiment and try different things. So I'm going to show you a couple of talk about a couple of things, but anything that turns up where you go, I want to put Java in over here. I want to try Java here. We have a fantastic design of a VM. We can take that and do wonderful things with it, but to do it, we need people, right? right? And so the open source of these activities is to allow us to share what we're doing, right? And this stuff that we're open sourcing is goes straight in our products. It's not like they're separate, but it means that anybody who wants to take one of those things and try out something new or just experiment, um, wait, go for it, right? And so open source, you know, the IBM keynote was about open, open, open. But it makes commercial sense for us, immense for us. And with things like Docker and Kubernetes, 
we have this massive open stack. Open, shouldn't say that, that's a thing. Um, <laughs> we have a open portfolio of technologies that we are building solutions on. They're all open, right? They're all open. They're all available for you guys to go off and hack and do cool things with it, right? So the, the idea is, is that those cadences we had, whether it was you know, Lambda and modules and things, we need to make you go faster. So the whole point of what we're doing so far is to enable us to do that, to get you guys in go involved, to get startups who've got a great idea for doing, I know, some sort of new GC, or they want to embed it in hardware. It's all there. You can take it, you can, you can modify it, you can, you can share, right? Right. And, you know, there are all these different there's app servers. You can go get OpenJDK with Hotspot. You can get OpenJDK with OpenJ9. You can go to adopt OpenJDK and download and use these things now. You know, you name your architecture. And if it's not there, it's not that hard-ish um, to put it on new ones, right? So the plan is, <laughs> and this is what I'm leading up to, is when take Java to places it's not been before. And you're coming too. We have to do this, right? Because if we don't make these changes, if we don't drive Java forward, it's going to get nibbled away, right? So it has to have this cadence. It has to have this new vitality. It has to be delivering this stuff, right? So let's start with the first one. This is not mine. I just stole this, okay? But it's true. IBM use, you know, we do cognitive but you can say machine learning, AI, whatever. Right? But what we do understand is how this is grabbing people's attention. So you probably can't see this at the back. Um, so a nice little marketing slide, right? But there's some interesting things in here, right? So they're like 96% of insurance C-suite guys intend to invest in cognitive capabilities. Data analytics, uh, um, machine learning is giving people massive benefits right? and it's just turning it's just turning up right uh, anything else to say in there um, no they're all the big numbers telecommunications retail healthcare everybody's going I begin to understand what I can do to take a uh, apply data analytics to my business how many of you are in that space? How many of you are learning new things in data analytics and machine learning? Okay. So maybe in a year's time, you'll all be doing this, right? The thing is, what this is, what this is bringing to us as Java developers is new things. This is what you've got to learn. We're beginning to move away from you going, I'm writing a Java program and I do this thing, I write code like this, to actually having to start to choose solutions, whether they're APIs or tool sets, that are gonna make use of these technologies, right? Basically, um, again, more of a marketing slide than anything else, but we are now able to gain insight into your data, and you gain insight into your data by applying either uh, Technologies you can buy off the shelf or APIs that you can call, right? And data transforming. Yes, it is. My point to you as developers is this is your new challenge. This is your next new challenge. The next new challenge is not about Java 9, which is still going to be challenging. It isn't about modularity. It isn't about lambdas. They're now. They're the next few days, the next few weeks, the next few months. This thing is going to change the way you think. And the whole point of me being here is to say, you need now to start thinking about changing the way you think, right? So who's worried? Right. So footprint, resilience, yeah, they're all technical challenges, but to a degree we've done them before, right? They're not new, new, right? We know how to do those. You can go read books about them. You can go read, you can go to DevOps conferences. You can learn a lot of stuff, right? Modularity, lambdas, G2E going to Eclipse. Again, it's all the now. So we worry about modularity, 
but it's still day-to-day -day business, right? It's when they ask you to do things like this. So, of course, you can't read this, of course. Um, tailor responses to the personalities of your customers without meeting <coughs> a single one of them. This is you as developers building systems that are not um, like you've ever built before. You mean like a chatbot kind of stuff or just or Ooh, more wider than wider that? Wider than that, much wider. Uh, chatbot? That's the basic stuff. That's the basic stuff, yeah. Okay. Now, having a chatbot that can hold a conversation with you that you can't perceive that they're not a human being, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And we can do that. The tech's out there. You've just got to invest your time, and you've got to invest knowledge. You've got to spend your time learning how to write a chatbot. And it isn't the same as writing a Java program, I don't know, to solve a crossword. It's totally different. Right. Um, what else we got? Um, Crisis that identify their own inefficiencies and address them automatically. Self-healing systems. So you may have built some fantastic system that's got thousands of microservices and you've got it in the cloud. And it's being logged, and it's wonderful. The idea now is, is you start to apply cognitive um, data analytics, machine learning, to your system. To start to predict when services are going to fail because when you get to a statistically large number you can start to do that right and you can start to join and create by analyzing your network patterns of what people are doing in terms of accessing your site you can start to predict what's going to go wrong what's going to happen what your load is going to be that's all out there now for you to use right but again uh, it's about you as job programmers learning how to structure your application to fit into these new models right and then there's the whole data mining, which is I'll give you a bunch of data, and from that you're going to figure out some insights. Right? And yes, that is in the purview of data analytics guys, and they use Python um, and Apache Spark and things like that. But the point is, we're going to try and change it so that it's you as Java programmers can do that too. Right? These things are coming, and these are things that you'll have to learn. So it is about learning to solve problems differently. And it's scary, because I can say it, and you're going, I don't know what you mean, right? Because you've got to go learn new things. So let's do an example. Um, word search. And for some reason, this word search has decided to put two characters in some boxes. It, it was fine this morning, right? But you know what a word search box is, OK? You hide words in here and you're going to scan it. So, typical Java programmer, you're going to solve this problem. What are you going to do? You've got a bunch of words and you're going to go line, 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 and scan to those lines looking for those words. And then you're going to do it this way. And if it's one of those nasty ones that does it um, this way or this way or in reverse, you've got to cater for those. But you know how to do that. That's just Java code. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, pseudocode, but you know what I mean? You know how to do that. Easy. It's just Java. Mm -hmm. And if we said, well, it's pretty big, this word search, and you decide that you're going to break it up and cluster it because you can, uh, there are technologies, Hadoop, Apache Spark, which you can start to learn. So the first thing you've got to do is learn how to compartmentalize this data <coughs> so that you can take a chunk of it and send it to a dupe. So now think of the complexities of what it takes for you to find partial words. So it's not the whole word. It's like, well, what if I find a bit here? Is that a whole word? Or I don't know. I haven't got the rest of the data. right? So now it's got more complicated. And then when you've got some partial sort of searches, you've got to bring it all back together again. So how many of you are doing anything with Apache Spark? Anybody doing? Cool, cool, cool. Right. So this is your next challenge. Not just Apache Spark, but this concept of having to think about your data differently. You've got to restructure your data in such a way that you can drive it through these 
and then bring the results back together again in a performant way. I can't teach you how to do that here. That's what you're going to have to learn, right? And on the back end now, and this is real life, right? You've got CPUs, uh, you've got GPUs, huh? you've got FPGAs, and you've got ASICs. That's hardware specifically created to solve a particular problem. Um, that's like one up from that. GPUs, you know what GPUs are, and normal CPUs. Right. So you can't just take this model of this piece of data. If you had a combination like this, you've now got to think about not only how you're breaking the data up, but how you're going to take that data and get these things to deal with it. Because now you're going to have to start learning about these things. And this is probably the one you're going to hit the most soon, right, is GPUs. And have we done any GPU programming? Good, good. And you're still here. Well done. Um, GPUs. GPUs are not CPUs. GPUs do lots of massive parallel. They do the same execute. They execute the same instructions at the same time on a different set of data. Right. We have built into our JVM um, examples of this. So you can go off and you, if you want to go off and get our OpenJ and stuff, um, you can get CUDA for J. But there's also some built-in stuff. So, for instance, you can take int streams. If you construct it properly, and you tell us to, and you have a GPU that's good enough, your work will get offloaded to GPU. Right? So, here's one of the things that we're doing, and this is where you're going to see more of this. More of us creating Java APIs. Sorry. More of us creating Java APIs that map the execution model and allowing you to start to think about it, but it's still going to be other things that you have to think about differently. If you use GPUs with the right amount of data, um, you can get 100 times speed up. Right. So this is so good, everybody's putting these in data centers. So um, you know our data centers, the soft layer stuff, you can go by GPUs. Massive, well, they're not they're about user size, but massive capability. And you can get loads of those. And if you've got data of the right type, so that might be doing word searches, it might be doing mathematical calculations, might be doing image manipulation, you can put the data in Java and have it executed on the GPU. Right? The challenge for you is you have to get the data in the right form for that to be useful and you have to make some decisions about how cost effective it is to offload. Because it takes time to move data from the VM to the GPU, because it's a different CPU, has a different bus for getting to. Right? If you get it right, massive improvements. Right? You have to have the data in different formats. Right? So again, what you've got to start thinking about is how you're looking at your data. I can't really say, go read this, go read this. You can go Google with this stuff. It's the, data, it's, the, it's the data transformations that you need to think about, and it's the fact that these technologies are bubbling up. You will be getting more and more access to GPUs. You can go get, there's a um, project called Sumatra, which uh, Oracle started, which was with AMD. And that was about taking Java and compiling it straight to the GPU. That's still around. That works quite well. We've gone with NVIDIA. We have a different approach. But you can go make use of that now. Go play with it and try it out, right? And get the, get the value of GPUs in your business. Right? But it gets even more scary. Um, so that's GPUs. The next one that's coming around. Anybody done any neural net programming? Yeah. You've got so much to learn. Okay. <laughs> neural nets. This is same thing. So, so I can't give you a program example for a neural net because it doesn't work that way, right? Neural nets are about training, are about initial conditions, about providing some data, in this case an existing one, and then getting some outputs. 
Um, and this is in the middle, I think, because it's not my chart, mostly because the other thing that keep popping up is object recognition, right? which is a neural net in itself. But again, it's people are, it's encroaching on your life. Right? Learning to manipulate images, do image processing on the server. Um, GPUs can do that for you. You'll find, again, you're learning new things. Right? So the first thing about this is, is that you don't get precise answers. We're now in the first stage of solutions where you do not get a yes or a no. So now you've got to deal with that. Now you're into no. Now you've got to start thinking about: um, is the answer correct? Is it close enough? They're not Java programmers. Things we were used to doing: true, false, right? And you're not going to get that. And then if you're going to get into this, the design of these networks. So you can go off and use Deep Learning for Java, which I encourage you to go play with because it's a cool thing. Um, that's Eclipse now, I think, as well. Um, and that gives you the Java toolkit to, to create neural nets. And what you find is that people talk about constructing these heuristically. Right? This isn't, again, you're going to write some programs to a spec. It's, okay, I've got a problem. I've got to learn how to write a neural net to solve my problem. So the first thing you've got to do is figure out whether that's the right technology to apply to the problem. And then when you have, you've got to figure out which are the many sets of ways neural nets are there are lots and lots of opportunities, which are those you're going to use, how you're going to join them together, right? And then how you're going to train it, because this is only as good as the trainer. And if you train it badly, you get bad, bad answers, right? If you have prejudices, biases, then this will copy them, right? Um, so there are some other things there, like new new off and stuff like that. But the primary thing is, the takeaway for you as a Java programmer is, these are just around the corner, right? If you're not using it today, you'll be using it soon, right? And it's a totally different world because you're constructing things much more heuristically. It's becoming more of a black box, right? And the answers are not anywhere near as solid as you might like, right? And then it gets more. So neural nets are great. Um, how about if we build one in a chip? Neo, neo, neomorphic, which is some sort of matrix thing. Right? How about a chip that's been constructed along the way that a brain works? Right? It's got a whole bunch of cores, and they, have, they, they are not von Neumann architecture. Everything is embedded. Right? They do. They communicate with each other. They've got their own memory. They they're event driven. So when one fires, just like your brain, right? So these are new, but these exist, right? And these are coming as well. So what this is, this is going to be you thinking about how you take your data and turn it into something that you can fit in your brain, that your brain can execute without it being it, right? And it's this is a long way up. But these things exist. I mean, they're quite chunky, but they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as soon as we have one in the back of a server, we'll be enabling the JVM to work with it. Whatever it takes, we'll be working on it. Right? Because these give us better answers faster, right? and we're all willing to trade off accuracy for speed. Um, and also, these will be able to solve problems that we probably couldn't solve before. Right, this is a very big black box. Neural nets are back black boxes to a degree. You can't figure out how they get the answers they do. This is going to be even more so. Right? Uh, and I think I've said that. So, um, you're all here because you want to hear about something else. Um, the strange stuff. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I have no idea why there's no pictures. Let's do the next one. Okay. Quantum computing. Who's got a quantum computer? <laughs> <laughs> How much do you think a quantum computer weighs? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty big. Uh, I have got a picture, but I'm not sure what to say. Right, so, quantum computing has been around for a lot, the theory has been around for a long time, right? It has been the, the, the hard bit, as, as you'd imagine, actually constructing it. It's entangling 
quantum things and having, as we always say, is the you get all answers at one go, at, at one time. Um, in general, when you're doing searches, there's, there, there's, it's proven that the answer to a search, the time it will take, can uh, be no less than the number of elements in the thing that you're searching, right? Yeah, there's, it's like, well, you make say, human makes sense, but it's been proven that if you have 1,000 elements, then when you have 2,000 elements, then uh, one will be twice as long as the other, right? At the least, right? It could be longer, but it can't be less. And then this guy comes along and says, well, actually, if you give me a quantum computer, I can cut the search time down by the square root of the number of elements, right? However, A, you need a cat, <laughs> right? And you need these qubit things. Now, I, this is where it all goes. Okay, I, I, I have a guy on my team now. I have two guys on my team. Um, one of them went to Cambridge or Oxford, and I can't remember which one. Um, and we've now got him out trying to explain this. Because I get it when he talks to me, and then I walk away and go, huh? Right. <laughs> so, the point being, we get this right, then search times or execution times for your complex algorithm is going to be a fraction. Right? And some people say things like, well, will you better factorize prime numbers? And you go, no, nobody can do that, but people still ask it. Right? So, okay. You can see you can't see that at all. It's nice. It's like something through a Death Star or something. <laughs> Basically, it's an enormous amount of stuff, including cryogenics, right, to get the tiny, tiny bit at the bottom, wherever it is, uh, down to yeah, 15 millikelvins. It's as cold as we can make it, and it has to be as cold as we can make it. So you're not going to have one of these in your laptop anytime soon, okay? This, and this thing is massive, right, and, okay? But IBM built one. And um, I want to say something like 15 qubits, right? So each of the, the more qubits you have, the more you, the more data you can search, the more uh, um, arithmetic you can do, right? You need lots of qubits, right? So if you're going to do lots of data manipulation, and your data is more than a few bits long, well, tough luck, you've got to wait, right? But once they get this into a manufacturing process and we can generate more, then you're going to get what people have been predicting, which is the ability to crack cryptographic uh, encryption quickly. So the number that I saw was that if they could get a billion, and bear in mind we were only at the, were the tens, we get a billion of them, pretty much any message being encrypted um, could be uh, broken in, um, I think it's less than a day. So, whereas the biggest um, supercomputer setup would probably take two years. Right? And the more we get, the quicker we'll be able to do it. So, this is coming, right? So, all your encryption is going to belong to us, but not for some time. Right? How are you going to use this? Right? Because I don't even know how it works, so I don't even know how to teach you what you do. But this is coming, and this is what's going to um, change your life, right? Or well, one of the things going to change your life. So you can go play with this now. You can go to this URL, and there is a live quantum computer at the back end. There's a programming environment, and it's not Java. There are some Python APIs, I think. So if any of you guys want to step in and write some Java APIs to replace, we'd be very grateful. But you can take, in conceptually, you can take the word search and by and rearranging the data correctly, and this is not what you'd expect, you can then have the word search. So what happens is you teach the quantum computer to do an exhaustive word search, right? But because of the nature of quantum, can I say that? Um, it will do all word searches at the same time. And when it collapses, you get the answer you're looking for. You can go um, play with this. It's like um, the lowest form of assembler you've ever seen in your life. You can construct these programs, and you can submit them to a real quantum computer, and it will come back, 
because it goes in batch, or you can use the simulator, which ironically is quicker. <laughs> right? No one. Yeah. Right. So I'm almost over. Um, we know what this will do, right? It's going to solve linear equations. I can solve linear equations, which we spend lots of compute on. It can do it so much faster, right? It will break cryptographic systems, for sure. It can model things. Anywhere where you're looking at exploring multiple choices, do I go this way, do I go this way, do I go this way? If you can construct the data correctly, you can, will be able to give it to this computer and have it do it faster than you could do it with you know, enormous amounts of compute. Right? And word searches. Word searches are easy. So the guy who explained it to me made it sound easy, so I assume it's easy. But the point, but we, you won't get a yes or a no, right? You'll get noughts or ones, okay? You won't get noughts or ones. Um, so let me, I've got this page. There's actually a battleship game you can do with quantum computing, right? It's called battleships. It's, it's the, uh, it's either the first or the second game ever written for computer, for quantum computing. But it doesn't say hit or miss. It basically gives you likelihood of damage, right? And it's plus or minus. And you have to work out. It might say, hey, minus 200% damage. That probably a miss. Or plus 75%. Is that a hit? Well, I don't know, right? right? But that's what you can do. That's the difference. So the difference is that the way that you think about the execution of your algorithms, your design of your algorithms, and the way you structure your data, right, is completely different from anything you've seen before. But that's okay, because by the time you get to here, you'll be experts in neural networks and machine learning and those things, because that's the new stuff you're going to be learning, right? right? And at the end of the day, because of the way the JVM is designed, we're reasonably confident that we can take almost any of those data models and figure out how to represent them in Java, um, and it may not be exactly the job you've got today, but because of the fact that we've got bytecode and we have GC, it takes away so much of the gorp that you don't have to worry about. And if you don't have to worry about it, then we can change the way we do things. Right? So we're pretty certain that we're better to do that. We'll still be waiting for a quantum computer to turn up your laptop, which is, you know, some time away. Uh, but the challenge for you is you've got to start getting ready to think differently. Right? Right? And there's a great opportunity. There's just, uh, what does this say? Um, so this is data. Right? By 2020, 1.7 megabytes of new information will be created every second for every human being on the planet. So your life changes from those things that you do today to being more about data scientists and data analytics people right? and using your Java skills to do those things, right? And we're going to try and make sure that you continue to use your job skills to do that because, well, it's in our interest, but if we fragment, it gets really hard to move things along because if we fragment it and say, well, we're only going to do that in Python, not in Java, then it gets really hard to evolve things. So trying to have one platform makes sense for everybody, right? And whatever the numbers say, um, it's basically enormous amounts of data turning up. IoT is just going through the roof, we're getting loads of data, and you can't do, you can't deal with them, right? You've got to move up a level and you've got to use new tool sets, right? And we're, it's all being reinvented, when, and it's in code, and we're going to try and keep it in Java code, right? That's our job, is to make sure that you can keep your job with your Java skills, as long as you learn new ones. Um, blah. So, yes. So, You've got to move from writing code like this uh, to doing it in streams, which you're beginning to learn, to starting doing neural, neural nets. Um, that's one of the places, isn't it? Um, down to quantum computing, right? There's, 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 there's your job. That's where it's going, right? And eventually, of course, we will have the quantum-enabled neural network clustered containers Analyze, cloudified, toaster for Java. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. I'm here for any questions. <laughs> so 
I can't I can answer anything about except for about the quantum computer. Right. Um, yes, sir. If um, well, this has to do with quantum. Sorry. If quantum computing can break encryption, can we assume that it's breaking encryption now? Say mm -hmm. NSA. No. 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 Because it's stupidly hard to get more qubits. I mean, I don't know how close we are, but bearing in mind that even the ones that we have in the lab are only two or three bits more along than the ones that you'd see online. Uh, the um, you need thousands, and I think it was last year or year before some company said they'd have a two thousand qubit solution, and it was all totally bogus. So I don't know when. But it's not yet. Yes? So for what it's worth, um, one of the reasons why Python is so big in well, science in general is because you can call Fortran like, super easy. <laughs> so if you're in NASA or NOAA, like, you can, you can uh, And that's right. Yeah. But at the same time, where Java owns uh, data analysis is Hadoop, Spark, yeah. uh, or distributed computation yeah. of big data sets. I mean, Java's at the center of that, and they're killing it right now. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the Hadoop ecosystem and stuff like that. So on the right side, like for, for as much as I like both Python and Java, right now they're, they're, they're doing good, but they're, they're both doing really, really well, but it kind of different things. Yeah. So, I mean, Python got a big head start on integration, those sorts of things, being able to add them in, yeah. And in some ways it doesn't really matter how well it performs because it's more glue than anything else. Um, so I'm told... I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but I'm told that if you're a committer on Apache Spark, of which there are not very many, you can you can get paid up to a million dollars a year. Go on. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and I'm not sure I'm not sure what skill set you need to work on one of those, but because it's the centre of all the stuff. Punchline there is scalp. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's Java too, right? <laughs> right. That's what I like is that it's JVM is Scala too. Yeah. Just wait for Java to catch up to Scala, but feature-wise. Yeah, but you see, I'm on the other side of the mirror, right? I'm a VM guy, and you like do whatever you want, because it's still VM, right? You're still giving me a class file and byte code. I don't care the rest of it, you know. <laughs> Any counts? Any? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, go on. I, I always find this uh, amusing to point out because a lot of people don't seem to notice this. You, me you mentioned earlier how Java has this reputation of being old, even yeah. though it, um, compared to some of the other languages that uh, people think of as newer. I mean, for instance, Python is older than Java. Mm -hmm. Most people don't really realize that. So is Ruby. And Ruby? I didn't even know that. See? Yeah. So Python and Ruby are older than Java, but people look at those as the hot new thing. That's like, <laughs> how can that even be? Like, what could have possibly led yeah. to that? So I think one of the reasons, if you, from a Java point of view, I'd say if you were trying to do something quick and easy, you wouldn't pick Java. Right? And I don't. I'd be going, oh, I need that. I'll do it in Node, or I'll do it in Ruby, or I'll do it in Python, because I can just write the script and run it. I don't have to compile things. And startup time was always a problem. Now, because of cloud economics... So those of you who are running things in the cloud, you're being hit by how much memory it takes, which is the smaller we can, if you can reduce the memory, saves your money. But also, because you're trying to scale thousands of things, startup time is important, because your service may not be around for very long, but if you're sitting there waiting for it to start, then you're having to get very complicated prediction things about what's the workload going to be next in a minute, do I start a JVM, do I kill a JVM because the workload's going to go down, and that's so much driven by how long it takes to start up. And so there's lots of effort to get start up down to as small as we can make it. Right? Um, and when that happens, then I think there's more chance. But I still think, if it was you, would you write something quick and dirty in Java? You probably wouldn't. No, you know. Because you can integrate with the operating system so much easier, blah, 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 you know, whether it's Bash scripts or Ruby or whatever. I said, I do so much more in Ruby just, just to do with DevOps and anything else, because it's just easy. Yeah. So we're not saying that Java's going to be the answer to everything, because we've already said things like Node is going to really take over the I.O. space, the um, I.O.-centric stuff, because it's really good for that. And the microservice approach which says you don't need big, fat application servers, you now have lots of thin things, 
the app servers are becoming more yesterday because we're uh, we're diluting all the value we put into app servers over the years is slowly disappearing because we're doing containers and microservices and we're having complex architectures where so much of what we put into app server is now being taken out by something else. Okay. Any more? Go on then. Go Sorry. On. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned there were new release cadence for Java, so every yeah. six months. Do you think that's going to have a positive or a negative impact on the like the libraries, the fragmentation of it? Because it's already hard enough to get our employers to move to Java 8, let alone 9. Like 18.3, 18.9, do you think the cadence of deployments is going to hinder more than help? Um, well, there's a big stick over here, yeah. which, is called, which is called, no, which is called Cybercrack. Okay. Um, so I think, personally, I think the cadence is fast. Um, I think it's possible. Um, I, I development teams can do it. Mm -hmm. Whether end users are going to go, no, no, we won't do that, is TBD. But I'll, um, sorry, uh, with the cadence going six months, I know one of the reasons, one of the ways that, for example, Ubuntu uh, uh, makes this trade off. Yeah. Or enterprise that are loaded to upgrade is they have long-term. Uh, so they can do that too. Is, is, is the yeah. 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 So there's going to be long-term support one, um, these six-month updates, and then there was talk about having features put in that weren't fully baked that you could use at your own risk, or they might drop them later on, which I think is just really bad thing to do. Um, but there we go. But uh, so I can tell you about the cybercrime thing because this is where you go. This is why I must be updating. What do you think makes um, the criminal fraternity more money, cybercrime or the drug strike? Who thinks cybercrime is bigger than the drug strike? Okay, we should all put your hands up because mm -hmm. it's it's more than more than. Cybercrime is better. You don't you don't have to even have to go to jail. <laughs> so <laughs> cybercrime. So 2016, last year, it overtook um, the drug trade, and by the end of 2019, it's supposed to be worth 21, $2,100 billion. 3% of the world's gross national product. And it's the one, right? And it's just, right? So actually, if you really want to get ahead, go and get spoke. <laughs> <laughs> so, think about this, right? Um, it's growing. Um, who, the people doing it, it's all organised, the people who do it are people like yourselves, but with a criminal bent, right? Developers, right? And they, they're really incented to do it as well, because, you know, profit share. Um, and they don't get caught. The stats are that the vast majority of people get caught for cybercrime are either really, really stupid, right? And they're just having a go, or the organised guys, the only reason they get caught is because they get raided for something else. So they're doing some other sort of crime, right? Something that's more physical. They get raided for that, and they discover they're doing cybercrime. It's horrific. So would it be your professional advice to not commit one crime while you're committing another crime? <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the other thing is not to, not to mix physical and virtual. Stay, stay out of meat space. That's where all the consequences are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's horrific, right? So, and... They social engineer people. You guys are all perfect targets. Right? Developers are, we just do all the stupid things. I've got a whole deck I could show you about the stupid things you guys do, <laughs> uh, which I do, right? Um, like, who's written their own fully trusting trust manager because they couldn't be bothered to deal with certificates? Good. Yeah! Good. Oh, good. Right? How many people have Googled for how to turn off a certificate checking on some tool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all do this stuff. All right. Um, and those things that we do, oh, the other thing we do, how many of you have downloaded some software from the web? <laughs> okay, how many of you have done that by putting a dependency into, say, a pod? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, cool. How many of you check the license for that thing in that pod? Okay, okay. how many of you check the, how many of you check the providence? Who's the guy who produced it? You know, can you find him? Has he got a record? You know, 
right? <laughs> How do you know? Right? But we don't. One of the things we're so good at doing is inserting software into our system that we don't check. Right? And there are so many examples of where that goes wrong. I mean, I could, as I could talk about for hours about how stupid we are as a community in how we trust people far too much. And it was all right a few years ago, but now the bad guys have got on and they'll take you. Right? And we're so trusting that we're just all the time through. Right? We tell them meetups. <laughs> right. So uh, I said you were getting out here live. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Was there any more? Okay. Go on then. Oops. Sorry. Uh, last thing about uh, quantum. Yes. Um, I just wonder what the APIs are going to be like for us. If for nothing else, then Moore's law has nothing to say about quantum. Uh, Moore's law, for example, has nothing to say about zero degrees Kelvin. We're getting we're getting close to there in terms of like. That's a the, good point. Uh, in terms of the state. So I, I suppose my question is just, what do we think the interface is going to be like? Because only the big industrial players, Google, IBM, yeah. Amazon, Facebook, are going to be able to afford these machines. As developers, what do we think the APIs and the touch points are going to be like for us? Yes. Because we're not going to have one in our house, right? At least, I would say, in, the, in quantum speak, I would say a 90% probability yes. that none of us will have one You wouldn't need air conditioning ever again. Um, <laughs> so it's a good question. Um, it's... We can write APIs that mirror, um, you can basically, there's a batch programming language, right? So you can create one of those to Java and you could submit it, but that's, that's not particularly complicated. What we'd like to do is figure out how we can represent the execution model as Java objects or something similar, and then how you construct it, right? Now the question is whether or not we can also figure out how to execute it so that you could run it with or without one. So ideally, that's what we'd like to do. Right? So it'll probably end up being some Java model to start off with. That'll be a set of Java objects that you can say so that's a qubit, and you'll be it'll be one level up, but not completely abstracted. And then ideally, we'll do it in such a way that we can execute it. Right? But I couldn't tell you what it is because I don't know what quantum quantum computing is. So you know. Thank you. Um, cool. cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time. I'm going to go home, and then uh, tomorrow I should be on a plane home, and I'm off to the UK, where I'm which I shall do this, and then on next week I'm off to Bulgaria to Java two days, where I'm doing this pitch again. So thank you for letting me rehearse. Thank you.